I thought I'd do as an opening prayer today um, is to actually read the prayer that Walter Wink lifts up in the chapter that we had to read today. And it's it's a prayer of Eddie Hillisum, who is the Dutch Jew. Um, as, as Walter Wink writes, who was anticipating her deportation to a work camp um, that proved to be a death chamber. And this is her prayer. And I thought this prayer was an important prayer for us to, even though we read it for tonight, but to just pray it as our opening prayer. And so I pray in the words of Eddie Hillisum. I shall try to help you, God, to stop my strength ebbing away. Though I cannot vouch for it in advance, but one thing is becoming increasingly clear to me that you cannot help us, that we must help you to help ourselves. And that is all we can manage these days and also all that really matters, that we safeguard that little piece of you, God, in ourselves. And perhaps in others as well, Alas, there doesn't seem to be much you yourself can do about our circumstances, about our lives. Neither do I hold you responsible. You cannot help us, but we must help you and defend your dwelling place inside us to the last. Amen. So this is, I don't think of this as our last time together. Um, and as I continue to reflect on this chapter and the epilogue of Dr. Wink's The Powers That Be, it drew me back to his third book in the trilogy. I um, mean, it's, it's probably one of my favorite books of Dr. Wink's, um, especially the, the section on intercessory prayer. Um, and there's so much we can discuss here about that. And it's thick with the theology of the powers. It's thick with, you know, it brings me back to the tradition I grew up in. Um, and it deepens that tradition, even though I've experienced such pain from it. But it has deepened my commitment deep in my commitment to prayer and miracles um, during this time of what I don't know how to describe the deep darkness that we experience. I'm still reeling from Texas and I was still reeling from Buffalo, but all the other incidences and experiences that we collectively as a people, um, not only in the United States, but globally are experiencing. And it's taken all of me to come to the space of like thankfulness and blessingness with this idea of prayer that Dr. Wink lifts up. That the power of prayer in the face of the fallen powers and the, ex and this, this, the expediency of the miracle that comes, right? Um, it's giving me peace and hope and action in this work. Um, more resolve in this work, if you will. Um, and so I'm going to invite each of you when we come into our groups and in, in the context of the quotes that I've put into the chat, and if you haven't gotten the, the quotes um, since you came, if you joined us a little uh, just now, we can put them in the chat again. But to reflect on what prayer is in our everyday life and how prayer manifests, right? It's this, you know, Dr. Wink is, is for me, is not leveraging prayer as a tactic or a strategy, but it is a real embodied, really embodied, what, what I think of, when I think of June Wink thinking about this, I think of like, how is your body prayer, your breath prayer, your action prayer, right? How is, prayer so deeply present in our everyday life that manifests the miracle, that makes the miracle come, even when we are completely 
like um, deluged by right the fallen powers, right? When we are witness to what's going on in Texas, what, when we witness what happened in Buffalo, what we're witnessing is going this ongoing conflict in the Ukraine, the annihilation of peoples, right? I'm inviting each of you to reflect on how this embodied, deeply engaged, profoundly present action calls us into this work of, right, of our calling, right, of our divine calling, and how that calling connects with each of, each of you who are here in this room, right, with everyone that's connected to us and those that we may not even know are engaged in this deep presence that prayer is connected to that manifests this miracle of redeeming the powers. And that's my invitation as we go into our breakout rooms. Um, Cause I wanna spend time. I want each of you to wrestle with what does it mean for us to be in this practice, right? In this practice of prayer, right? In this embodied sense of this world, in our relationship with God, in the work that we do within this domination system that we are all part of, right? What is this ultimate transformation, right? That we are each, each of us, each of us, right? are committed to. Um, and as we think through these quotes that were posted earlier this week, and as we reflect on my conversation with Bill Wiley Kellerman um, last week, um, but also as we face, you know, someone, um, a number of people had given us feedback of what does it mean when we are pushed to the edge of violence, when our reaction is to operate because we see such violence to others, such dehumanization, such tragedy, that it takes all of us, all of our spirit, our energy, our community, not to act out in violence. But our re initial reaction is, I can't believe this is happening to innocent kids to elders who are shopping for food, right? That in prayer and in the act of prayer, in the embodied prayer that we are presencing in and we're asking for and, and manifesting the miracle, what does it mean for us to engage in that nonviolent reaction? Bill Wiley Kellerman had, had said last week to me, this is practice. It's not perfection. And Bill, please correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. right. um, and, and, and in doing so, I'm now rereading um, William Stringfellow's A Simplicity of Faith, which is dedicated actually to Bill. Um, but in that chap, in, in one of the chapters in that book, that wink actually refers to in a second book in the trilogy, right? Prayer is part part of prayer is to rehumanize each other, right? To us, right, to, to find God in us, but also to find God in, in the other that we've distanced ourselves from. That's a hard ask for me when I'm going, oh my God, there's a person who just killed a whole bunch of kids. And in, in and even though I'm so distant in, in physical distance from Texas, right? It hits hard, it really hits hard. And it's taking a lot of me, and this is me and my own brokenness, right? To navigate through, what does it mean to rehumanize that space? And to quell my desire to arm everyone in that state, right? 
And I'm going, no, that's uh, to instead I, you know, I, I, and, and Ethan in the chat before, as we, people were coming in was like, oh, actually, how do I work? How do I join Ethan in a desire actually to disrupt this convention that's going on at the NRA, right? Instead of, right, right, this desire to arm, right? It was interesting to see when, when, as all of you were coming on for me to actually read the chat. And I was like, wow, Ethan, thank you for this. This was helpful for me to remind me as part of the cadence of prayer, my own prayer, my own practice of prayer, right? We need each other to, to not only hold each other accountable, right? But to help us practice this, right? To practice nonviolence, to practice, right? Prayer helps that practice for me. It reminds me that in a space of intractability, when there is no hope, right? We can, as womenist theologians often say, there is a way to, there is a way out of no way, right? You can make a way out of no way to get beyond this almost impossible place, right? To actually repivot. Ethan helped me to repivot. Bill has consistently been helping me repivot, right? But that's that prayer for me. Like prayer for me is that cadence. And I'm curious if that's prayer for you, right? So as we break into groups, my invitation is to each of you, right? To reflect, discern, engage, wrestle with what Dr. Wink is meaning by prayer. And what is he calling each of you when you read about intercessory prayer? What does that, that mean to each of you in these times that we are in, in what we are witnessing now? And how does it help us, as he writes in that last quote I put, I think, you know, help us not be distracted by the delusions, right? <laughs> but instead being liberated. It's relief at being liberated from delusions, right? Being spun over, right? Through us, to us, on us, in us, by fallen powers, right? And that may sound really heady, but it's actually really true, right? There's this sense of, I get really distracted and it was really important, really practically important as we began this for, as an example, again, for Ethan to just say, hey, Fernando, I'm just gonna say, how do we do this kind of thing instead of what I was internally been boiling, my blood has been boiling about, right? Because I was getting distracted, right? And prayer reorients me, right? The prayer that Wink shares with us of the Dutch Jew, right? Her deep prayer, right? Is, is a prayer at the face of death, right? <laughs> the face of her own annihilation, of her erasure in this reality. It's a prayer of those kids in that classroom And it reminds me, do I need, no, we cannot rearm, right? <laughs> Even though there's this tendency for me to go there, right? And it's my habit of, my distract, the distractions of, the tactics of the material, right? To go into that space of, hey, my react, go with that reaction. And instead, prayer almost pauses me from it. It pauses me to get back into my body, to get back into that pain and hurt where it's residing in my body and remembering and recalling about how that pain and hurt and suffering is connected to a lot of pain and suffering in this world and how that prayer is a reminder of in the pause, in that space, how we can collectively work with each other towards the miracle, right? And so in reflecting on this, 
And on this last chapter in the epilogue, I'm inviting each of you to think, think about and, and really embody right? how that last, that last sentence in Eddie Hillisum's prayer, right? You cannot help us, but we must help you. We must help you, right? We must help you, great spirit, right? God, to defend your dwelling place inside us, and I would argue each other to the last. And so I want us to break out into room, break out rooms and, and reflect on sort of prayer and the powers and the actions that prayer and I would argue miracles, right? Bring us into that space of social action, right? It inspires us into that space of social action and engages us in that space of social. It sustains us in that space when we're tired, we're exhausted, we're still horrified, we're frustrated, we're angry, right? We're reactive. So my invitation is how do we, each of us, understand this chapter in relationship to our everyday lives? And what is this role of prayer in our everyday lives, intercessory prayer in our everyday lives? With all of its, you all are probably much better at prayer than I am. I think I had mentioned to Bill uh, during our first conversation, I'm really bad at prayer still. You know, I'm still doing my best to keep on at it, right? And Bill keeps on reminding Fernanda, it's practice, right? Practice, let go of judgment, right? Release it, practice, come back to it. Practice, come back to it, Fernando, right? We're here together. Where is your community of practice to remind you of your prayer, right? To come back into the cadence of prayer. And that cadence of prayer connects to what Wink talks about as miracle, right? That manifestation of, right? Something that is deeply transformative within this domination system. And each of you may understand, conceptualize and embody that, right? In many different ways, right? But as Walter Wink and June was talking about this uh, as we were beginning as well, like in my struggle to become human, that is part of Wink's work too, right? <laughs> it's that it's not perfection, but it's this ongoing, right, engagement, right? It's relational. It's not outcomes oriented, right? It's not the expectation of the outcome, but it's deep in deep process with each other and God's world. And I'm always going to remind myself that June is in my ear saying, your body is there too, Fernando. Don't forget where your body is in relationship to other bodies, in relationship to the world that we live in. And sometimes that means your body may be on the line or is on the line all the time. But your body in prayer, right, is with God and God is in you. And how do we each remind ourselves of that in community as we practice in prayer? So we're gonna take some time to discuss this hopefully, or whatever part of this, this final chapter and the epilogue um, whatever part you're wrestling with or inspired by um, to share in your groups. And so Bill, I think, is putting us into groups. Yeah, I, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, um, if anybody needs it, uh, I've put the questions or the discussion topics in the chat and I've opened uh, four rooms here and I'm going to hopefully you should be getting an invite uh, to a room. Yeah. Welcome back, everyone. Back. We were just getting going. 
<laughs> Were you just getting going? Okay. Um, I'm sorry we pulled you out into the larger plenary and I'm 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 actually curious what were you were so what were you in the midst of? Uh it was that Paul with, that was saying that or Paul and Judith and uh, Martha and we were joined also by uh, Max. We were talking about what does prayer have to do with Putin? <laughs> okay, and, um, beautiful. Yeah. Well, how, how can holding Putin and Biden, I mean, we're in a particularly dangerous moment and uh, the importance of prayer right now. And what were you discussing about? They the light. What was that, Paul? I'm sorry. Oh, and... I'm a Quaker at this uh -huh. point of my life, although I was raised Russian Orthodox and families from Ukraine. It's very personal. Mm. Uh, the, the importance of holding Putin and Biden and other decision makers in the light that this does not ex accelerate to nuclear weapons. Uh, but none of us seem to be to find a way forward uh, in terms of how this might help. It's very, it, yeah. <laughs> we ended up somewhat despairing. Uh, at least I ended up somewhat despairing. Mm -hmm. mm. Did others in your group want to add to that? Uh, I'm feeling that, that heaviness in that. Because it is heavy, right? Um, yeah. Martha and Judas were part of the group. Yeah. And Martha, Ma Martha, Judith, or Max, would you like to add to that at all or, or others in response to that? Yeah, I don't really have anything to add to what Paul already said, except that, you know, I was saying individual prayer comes so much easier for me. But when I think about it in terms of, of Russia or global issues or issues that I can't personally do very much about, that's when it gets really hard. Mm. Mm. I, and I was saying at the very end, I did appreciate Wink's comment about God does hear our prayers. Yep. They have heard our prayers, but it's the powers that get in the way. We don't blame the God for not listening. It's the powers that get in the way. Yeah, because that's precisely what it is, right? It's the powers that actually block us from God, right? It's or distract us from God, as well as distract us from God in ourselves, right? Um, and God in each other, right? But couldn't one look at it as also... God not interfering with his gift of free will. So that's and, a big issue, right, Carlos? Uh, Go for it. Yeah. Uh huh. So, for instance, uh, you know, it, it's almost as if um, in there's some difficult situations that I have to deal with. Um, I've given up on praying to God for, say, desired outcomes. Uh -huh. In terms that involve other people doing the right thing when they're hell bent, I guess I use that word correctly, <laughs> on doing the wrong thing because they're not going to listen. And but what I can pray to God for is to give me the wisdom so that I can navigate through that morass. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, you know, and it, for me, it's been fascinating this whole dimension of principalities and i hadn't noticed before in my reading of daniel um that hey i would have been here sooner except this yep. mean angel was blocking my way um mm -hmm. <laughs> that was fascinating um but so so it's you've got that dimension of principalities you also have the dimension that people are going in a you know are trying to do the wrong thing there are some people that will do that for varieties of evils and i keep thinking too on um stringfellow's constant mm -hmm. uh 
invocation and the language of the demonic, mm-hmm. the demonic possession. Yep. Um, and of principalities, but of people. Uh, yep. And I think for the for me, one of the clearest signs of that is when someone starts orienting all of their action to the aggrandizement of self. Yep. Um, when I see that happening, when whoever it is in whatever position, no matter what side of whatever dimension of an issue it may be, if I see that person consistently moving to uplift their selves at the expense of anything else around them, then I know that they've opened up the playground to that which is evil. And they become possessed, right? I think yeah. Wink is very clear yeah. in, the, in the trilogy. If you, I think in the second um, book of the trilogy, um, Wink is really clear. And I think it's working off of like um, Stringfellow and others, right? Who like that possession, right? It's not even opening up the playing field. It's, it's actually being, embodying, mm-hmm. right? Being possessed with, right? The powers and principalities are deeply fallen, right? And that distracts, right? That distraction is towards, I think, this is my bias, is that, that bias is towards the material, right? The earth mm-hmm. of the earth, mm-hmm. right? Ego is of the earth, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But God's earth is also the creation of God is is wonderful and beautiful, right? But it's the corruption of the ecosystem of the earth that 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 ego for me is bred, right? That possession of being possessed, right, mm-hmm. is not honoring the ecosystem. It right? is not honoring our bodies. It's not honoring each other, right? It is not honoring God's creation, but instead is the distraction of that fallenness, mm-hmm. right, of the powers. Is what I'm. Uh, that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. That's my how I've understood Wink, and now I'm understanding even more Stringfell and Wiley Kellerman and others. Right, is this deeper sense of right that that fallen powers that are redeemable. Right, this is. It's not hopeless. Right, Carla? I mean, that's my also I'm not my sure. take. Well, this is my this is where I read Wink in that space, right? And where Wink I read is definitely, oh, Go ahead, Carla. I agree. I agree that Wink is definitely moved in that direction. But if I I what I'm gathering from Stringfellow, yep, is that he his point of departure in the ethic for alien for Christians and other aliens is the book of Revelations. Yes. And I brought this up in our in our group. I mean, in the book of Revelations, you don't have Babylon being redeemed in the end. Babylon is destroyed and there's a heavenly chorus of hallelujahs. The Antichrist is not redeemed in the end. The Antichrist is vanquished forever. So for me, the the where that's pointing me to is I do believe with my heart that all humans are redeemable i don't believe that the principal all the principalities are redeemable and this is where we might and i'm i want to invite others and i just i'm also just going to invite us i'm just going to invite us in the space of thinking about how the principalities may like babylon in our in our interpretation may have been destroyed, but I, my invitation that I hear from Wink and Stringfellow and Wiley Kellerman and others is that there's a transformative power in it, right? Mm-hmm. It is that Babylon is not necessarily annihilated, right? But actually transformed, which is a hard reading for me who have been like, if you're like, I'm a theology student, right? And so I'm thinking in this way of like, well, what is the Greeks, what, what, is, what are New Testament theologians thinking about in Revelations? When I read Wink talking about this, right? For me, it's that transformative place. Like actually Babylon transforms, right? <laughs> right, it's, it's because of its fallenness that it seems to in the material, but remember, it's not only just the material, but the spiritual connected, right? It's integrated, right? 
materially, right, it may be seemingly annihilated. But you have like there's a there's a transformation that occurs in that space in Revelations, right? That I'm invited to think about and consider, right? And that re to renew into, right? Because that redemption is not somewhere out there, right? Wink is really clear that that redemption is here and now, right? It's in our presence, right? So, Carl, I mean, I, I, I want to, you know, wrestle with this and maybe Bill has something to say that will correct me, um, consistently correct me. And I'm curious what other folks in your group were wrestling when you were talking about this. Um, because there's real implications on, for instance, what we pray, how we pray, right? Where we pray, where we engage in prayer and how we engage and understand miracles in our world, right? Because if, if we anchor to the principalities cannot be redeemed, right? The powers aren't redeemed, principalities aren't redeemed, then where, where, how are we here right now? Right? What are we doing, right? Well, if you look at the, the principality of the crack cocaine industry, that needs to be destroyed. The people that engage in it, need to be redeemed and the people that are enslaved by it need to be helped and and so my there so i'm always going to go to the root cause right the root cause like how do we because wink invites me to that place when i talk to bill wiley kellerman in this room like he's always pointing to that room like Crack cocaine is the downstream, like bad water in Flint, Michigan is the downstream of something that is deeply at the root, the core of that fallenness is way more upstream, right? Than crack cocaine. And in order, I, I get what you're saying, Carlos, destroy it, right? Yeah, of course, right? But that's a violent, that's all, there's a violence in that force, right? In a way, the invitation is how do you transform how, what does it look like to transform the upstream so that you don't even see the downstream, right? That you don't see the manifestation of the crack cocaine industry, right? How do we attend to, like, the sacredness of water is more upstream, right? Mm. Yeah, downstream, people are dying of drinking bad water, right? <laughs> We don't even just have to look at Flint. We can go anywhere in our country where there is, right? Water issues. We are killing ourselves, right? And that's the, the invitation I hear from Wink and others. Right? And this is why I'm always gonna also, like June is in this room. My June, and I was saying in the breakout, I was like, June reminds me that our bodies are our, how we move in this world, right, right, is a reflection of our ongoing practice in relationship with God in this world, even the fallenness of that world, right, even the fallenness, because it is our relationship with that fallenness that has the potential to transform, like how we relate to the fallenness, right, is to actually orient towards transformation for me. Like whenever I hear June, I'm like, okay, June is reminding me, Fernando, stop being violent, right? Stop being aggressive, but actually what is, how are you curious about that transformation, right? And where's your body in that space of that transformation, right? My tendency is to go, hey, how do I get rid of it, right? What do I need to do to get rid, right? To excise our world of this evil, right? And my question to each of you and the invitation, and, and, and I, you know, I, I don't know if this is completely off, is how do we actually transform, right, that fallenness? I mean, that's the invitation, that's part of that mantra, the powers are good, right? The powers are fallen, the powers are redeemed, right? Can be redeemed, right? And in that mantra for me is this notion that 
it's not an excision, right, per se, but a transfer, there's this move, there's a transformation, the process, right, that I don't even know if that outcome can actually happen or actualize in my lifetime, right? Like, I don't know, like, and that's why even June was reminding me, it's like, hey, Fernando, stop, like, that's not the outcome. The outcome is to remember, right, in process, in this present, right, you know, and not, not have anxiety, fear, anger, expectation, but to be in process, right, toward that actual transformative and redemptive act, right? And that is being and living, for me at least, right, in the redemption that will come because the redemption is here, right? I don't know if that made any sense at all, Carlos. So when I, when I'm reacting to you, and I, you know, it's it's not out of like, oh my God, I'm not just, it's not in a disagreement, but this wrestling with what revelation means in this space. And when I read that revel, what, when I'm reading those those passages that you're you're quoting, right? So I'm curious if other people in your group were or others. Bill, you wanted to say something, Bill. Yeah, I wanted to to Go weigh in it. there just a little bit. Uh, yeah. Uh, Correct me I if I'm think wrong. there's a I think there's a tension between Walter and Stringfellow uh, yeah. on this, and I, I don't think there's any question about that. Um, one of the things that I think both of them would say that part one of the dimensions of the fallenness of the powers is their imagination, which is facilitated by human worship idolatry of them uh that they won't die yeah and in fact uh they do <laughs> they're creatures they're subject to mm. uh, not only to the power of death but to dying and uh there's no question that uh the book of revelation uh there are the doxologies in heaven when rome babylon falls, collapses, comes to an end, dies, right? Um, and I think that's, uh, in a way, that's part of their being restored to their creatureliness, <laughs> being brought low. Um, uh, the things that Walter would point to uh, later in the book uh, is that uh, in the New Jerusalem, there's a great procession and the kings of the earth are in the procession. It's like, what? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, and then secondly, uh, the leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. Right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, both of those are in the, in the culminating vision where uh, the powers that have been uh, met death, met their deaths, died, if you will, uh, are end up end up being restored in some in some sense, you know, at least in the metaphors of the apocalyptic vision. And Bill, is that is that restor what is that restoration, do you think? You know, what is that is that a renewal or is that like a res restoration of, of, of what? Well, Walter would certainly say a uh, restoration of their vocation uh, to serve human life and creation, you know, as opposed to dominate it. Um, Mm -hmm. Stringfellow would say that as well. Right. So coming back into their divine vocation, is that restoration? Uh, of, their, of their calling. I mean, and, uh, you know, Carlos is raising this question, are there, are there powers uh, um, to the white supremacy be redeemed? Oh, well, my name is Omar. Right. Or is... Does, does white supremacy name uh, the fallen uh, aspect, the bondage to death, of what is actually the diversity of creation, right? Mm. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I, uh, there are, you know, there are any number of those things that uh, Nazi Germany, right? Yeah. Uh, um, Mm -hmm. I was also in our group uh, lifting up the Daniel 10 passage, which Walter deals with in every one of the trilogy books and others as well. Um, um, and personally, I don't think he says it quite this quite this way, but it would fit with uh, his thinking that the, that the war in heaven is actually a war that's going on inside Daniel. Mm -hmm. right? the, the empire's yeah. gotten inside of him, the spirit yes. of Persia uh, mm -hmm. is inside of him, and he can't hear the word of God, right? Yes. Um, and it takes the, takes the archangel Michael, Israel's angel, to sort of shake that up and break it's an internal on the one hand it's an internal conflict on the other hand you know the spirit of empire the spirit of violence that we're living in you know and we just the things the events immediate events of the last few days that uh, we're we're living in literally prevents the word of god from getting through you know it's it's not just inside an individual. It's it's yeah. uh, it's a uh, within the social structures and the culture. You know the uh, uh, the, the domestic armaments industry. You know? Yeah, and it manifests in a lot of different ways. It's not just in like military incorporated or pharma incorporated or right it's in collective our collectives of peoples of cultures that are even beyond things like industry right um you know and 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 it feels like we are in cycles that repeat over and over again throughout this right um did others want to come? I also wanted to raise what um, Susan was raising in the chat as well, and just really pay attention to what's going on. And so Susan, I don't know if you wanted to um, sort of ask your question collectively or share that or share some of your, your insights. Well, uh, in, in my faith, which is um, Islam, we believe um, that Jesus, the Messiah, will come at a point when the world has uh, become in such a horrific state. And um, we see that all around. I mean, of course, uh, the beginnings of World War III, um, the fact that there are more guns in the United States than people. Uh, you know, I, I don't need to tell all of you um, how society has degenerated so horrifically. And as um, the former executive director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, the Reverend Dr. Emma Jordan Simpson used to say that the United States is the greatest purveyor of evil in this world. And, um, you know, so what at what point um, in, in the Abrahamic faiths, we believe in the coming of a Messiah uh, in the Christian and Islam, uh, Islamic faiths, we believe that Messiah will be Jesus. Um, in the Jewish faith, it's not stated who that Messiah will be. I don't know that it's known. Um, but in any case, uh, empire, uh, you know, it, it's incumbent upon us to wrestle with evil and empire and to do our best as part of what as Muslims would call a jihad, the internal struggle to purify ourselves and continually intentionally align ourselves with the will of our creator, which is a will of love and compassion and mercy. But in the face of this empire, whether it be the, 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 the behemoth military industrial complex, prison industrial complex, gun lobby, et cetera, 
it's sometimes as as this week with with Buffalo and in Texas, it, it's so overwhelming. So my question is, did Walter Wink have anything to say about when the Messiah will come? That's a very important question, Susan. And I am not a Wink expert to be able to answer that, um, but maybe our community here um, might want to weigh in on that. I, I, this is Martha. I don't know. I, I think it's unknown. It's not, um, it's not us. I mean, it's, it's God acting through us. I mean, this is my th understanding that like Daniel, you know, 21 days or 21 years or 21 centuries, I don't know, but it's, it's not us. You know, I guess we have to be the light for each other to to keep it keep it on, and that's um, what part of what prayer and does. Um, and yeah, we're in a dark place now, so it's a good question, but I don't know. Thank I have you. a thought about that. <clears throat> My thought is that, uh, you know, based on what I've read from Walter and read about five of his books now, is that the second coming is the coming that is happening right now in our own hearts mm -hmm. as we open up to the, and, and we live the message of Jesus in our lives and through our prayer and through our, through our joy and through the, and through the love that Jesus um, has brought to the world and, and invites us to engage in. That's my sense of it. Thank you, James. And thank you, Martha. Yeah. And thank you, Susan. I think, you know, that, you know, as each of you are talking, you know, for me, the call to prayer is that reminder of that work, right? Of this, this engagement with love, for instance, right? Our belongingness with each other, mm -hmm. right? That, that there may be a second coming of Christ that's out there, but I think Wink reorients us to this presence, right, James? It's like almost what you were saying. It's like that, that yes, that may come, but that's here too, right? It's now. Um, and that's our work of now, our work with our everydayness. And that call to prayer is in that engagement with love, for instance, that, that run through all three of the Abrahamic religions, as well as many other religions um, and other belief systems, right? That deep love and deep, and I would argue coupled with that is our belongingness with each other, right? Mm -hmm. Right, that deep belongingness, right? That in the face of like, these industrial complexes and 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 the profound darkness that you were saying, Martha, right? That instead of that despair, is that our prayer is into that space of love, right? That our prayer, that call, our call to prayer is into that, into that space of belongingness, right? And Carlos, did you want to comment on what Stringfellow makes clear? I mean, I could, I was doing that so I wouldn't take up. Uh, speaking volume, um, but I read um, also through the the ethic is that he comes back to the steam time and again um, to he admonishes, warns us, don't get into the trap of trying to figure out, oh, am I working with God's will or am I in God's design? He says, no, that's not our place. Our place is to live biblically, to live as well as we can. So I was thinking about this conversation, you know, when might be the second coming? Uh, apparently, it's going to be like a thief in the night. So we just have to be awake and be doing what we need to be doing. And I'm going to lift up a little bit of Stringfellow in, and this helped me think of, of Walter Wink's third trilogy, the third book in the trilogy of 
Wing, um, Stringfellow writes in um, A Simplicity of Faith um, that prayer in, quintesse in, in quintessence, therefore, is a political action. So, Carlos, is not a, for me, it's not only just living biblically, but it's also, right, because it's, it's, it's I think, Stringfellow, and Bill, please correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm always, re I'm, I'm so new to Stringfellow, right? But it's a political action, an audacious one, right? It's real that, and at that, bridging this gap between immediate realities and ultimate hope, right? Like str for Stringfellow, and, and what I think Wink writes about in this last chapter, right, is that it is not an either or, but a both and, right? And it's everything in between. So it is this immediate reality that we're in, and this ultimate hope that Susan was uh, like, talk, like, where is that ultimate hope, right? That we're going toward, right? Between ethics and eschatology, between the world as it is and the kingdom, which is vouchsafed. You know, and for me, this is that both end. This is that spectrum, that wink in this chapter and what prayer is, right? Prayer is now, and connected to that future that, hey, it's going to come, but be be present, right? I'm always going to come back to June because June's going to be like, hey, Fernando, you are present. Your body is here, right? And there's a whole bunch of other bodies that are here. And there's a whole bunch of bodies that are getting annihilated here, right? Whether it is like pharma incorporated or the military industrial complex or the prison industrial, whatever it is, right? And that prayer, like Stringfellow says, is a political action. It's audacious, it's an audacious one. And Wink for me resonates that, right? Like in this chapter, Wink says, really deepens that. Right. And for me and where June comes in for me is that my body and your body and all our bodies here are part of that. In this presence. Right? And so I appreciate how each of you and your insights on this have like and, and I hope we will continue to wrestle with this. Um, as we can, as we continue to, as, as we disband this particular reality that we're in, mm -hmm. right. But to really, really continue to engage with the powers, with what, right. The powers that be, we need to engage, so, you know, Wink's invitation, right. For me throughout all of this book, right. This culmination in prayer, and also in the manifestation of the miracles, right, is to attend to an address, right, the powers that be. And to remember this ongoing mantra of the powers are good, the powers are fallen, the powers can be redeemed. That is a deep mantra, right, that, pr that prayer, right, reminds us of the God within ourselves, within each other, and within this world. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Carlisle. Go for um, it, Carlisle. Yep. The talking about the, the bodies, talking about the politicization of, you know, our decisions. About an you know, how, how do we view disagreements in faith? That is abortion. You have very strong arguments on one side and on the other, and certainly they are willing to, uh, on both sides, demonstrate, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and, and this is definitely more in the in the political realm, but how does one differentiate between two powers, if you will, which one, which one needs uh, uh, to be uh, uh, reinformed or re realigned, or re uh, awakened? 
And so, Carla, thank you for that. And I, you know, I, and I think we can get into a huge discussion of how we can reorient and what does that look like for each of us in this space, right? I'm going to just invite us to, to, as you spoke and we're thinking about this, I'm, you know, and I, when I was, I, when I, when people ask me these questions, I'm always coming back to what Carlos was talking about earlier. It's like, how do we come back to the root of what these downstream polemics are about, right? How do we come, what is really at the root of that polemic between if you, whatever the issue is, right? Whatever that issue is, whether it's abortion, whether it's the right to bear arms, whether it is whatever the issue is, right? It is what is at the soul and spirit, right? The deep root of that issue, right? Where are each of us in that space, right? Because we can go, we can get distracted into the polemics and you can be on one side of the aisle and I could be on the other. You can be in one part of the earth and I can be on the other. And never do we come together, right? To engage with what is really at the heart of, the spirit of, right? That place, that context, that space we share. Mm -hmm. I don't have an answer, Carlisle. Is the, the invitation is to just be deeply radically curious about, for me at least, where is the, the, the root of, where's that spiritual dimension of what we consider this binary or this polemic or this argument or this conflict? Okay. I, I would agree. Um, and, and maybe, I hate to say this because I'm <laughs> definitely, um, in favor of a woman's decision to make a choice. Um, but it may be we need to regard more caringly the arguments of the side we don't agree with. Um, it just, it sounds like you're going to close out. And, and just a couple of things I'd like to say. One, this has been enormously wonderful. And I'm so glad to be a part of it. Uh, I'm in the very early stages, and maybe it'll never get done, but I'm in the early stages of, of writing a book. And I'm, you know, a big part of it from the beginning, even before this, was that I wanted to include um, a wink uh, as to uh, reformulating what it is to be human and a variety of other things, but a very biblical approach. And I also want to call our attention to um, the, the movie of, of uh, Clint Eastwood, if you haven't seen it, Grand Torino, mm -hmm. where the examples are very powerful about violence, mm -hmm. about re, uh, revenge, and then finally what he does at the end to uh, stop um, the, uh, uh, the the tremendous uh, abuse of other people by this uh, inner city gang. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not familiar with it, you might find it uh, useful. Thank you for that, Carlisle, and 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 thank you for that um, the invitation for us to actually wrestle with this as well. Um, is it possible that that all of these materials would continue to be available? Um, yes, they are. They're on our on our page on the Wink page. I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Every every video is um, posted on there, including inter, interstitial videos between sessions. So I'm going to put that in. It's 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 forusa.org slash Wink, uh, but I'll put that in there right now. And so in perpetuity, it will be available, so to speak. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And, and um, before we close, I, I will say that we are, FOR USA uh, um, is actively engaged with what are, what are our next steps with this, right? And how do we continue to engage with um, 
uh, and commit to um, not only Dr. Wink's work and not only June's work, but other theologians and other practitioners in this field who are um, really wrestling with these issues and you know navigating through these contexts and these spaces in nonviolent ways. You know, what? How do we continue to um, support each other and our communities of practice? Um, uh, in engaging with the powers and engaging with the powers nonviolently and how we can be transformative in this, each of us, how are we each transformative in that space? Um, and so with that, uh, Ethan, did you want to sort of say some closing words? And then I will close with a prayer. But before Ethan says something, I just want to really, I'm so deeply thankful um, for each and every one of you who are here today, as well as who participated in this. Um, uh, I don't, it's just been a gift, to be honest with you. Um, it's been a gift to have each of you present here. Um, um, but to be in prayer with you each, I feel like this, what we've, every, t every month that we've come together has been an act of prayer. Um, and I and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for each of you, and I hold you in peace and in deep blessings. And so, Ethan, if you want to for one two seconds, real quick, Ethan Fernando, thank you so much. Um, just so people know that we're gonna we we are this is the last session with Fernando, but we are gonna have a handoff, so to speak, where Fernando is gonna actually be in person, believe it or not, with June in in uh, at her home, uh, and we're going to do it on a Wednesday or Thursday in, in June. At some point, we're don't have a final, and we're, we don't have a final date yet. But we're looking at either the eighth or the ninth, or the twenty uh, second or twenty third, I believe, right now. And we're going to have the hand handoff to next year's fellow Tabitha, uh, Reverend Tabitha, and uh, so we look forward to that. Um, and uh, we appreciate all, all of you done. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you so much for everything, for all the hard work. I know people are saying so. You did a great job. And uh, thank you, June, as well. And thank you all for being such you know resolute people. We've had great numbers all along. And uh, we also are hoping to do something with Bill Wiley Kellerman, maybe within the next 12 months, we'll do something on String Fellow, Fernando. You know, you're never gone. You're always a part of us. So we hopefully we'll be involved. But thank you so much for that. And then, Ethan, I'm going to send this to you. And then, and then we'll have a prayer from Fernando and say goodnight. Oh, you both have stolen my thunder or whatever uh, kind of thing. So, uh, again, uh, immense gratitude to everyone here, whether you've been here once or all five times. And I don't think anybody in the circle right now has just been here uh, one time. But uh, whatever, it's been just a privilege for me uh, personally and on behalf of FOR to share this space with each of you and especially you, Fernando, as you've uh, just offered us a, a guiding a process, uh, a journey uh, through this sacred text um, and to really um, dig down deep inside ourselves and and pray and learn together. Um, so I'm really grateful for that. I look forward to more of this in, in other ways. Um, both in uh, the context with uh, Fernando as uh, you finish this uh, season with us and um, become our first alumni of this fellowship and, and, and continue to walk with us in other ways. And it, as Bill said, with uh, Pastor Tabitha Holly, who we're really just excited to start journeying with and, and learning from her. And I know she has some ideas about how she'd like to do some um, deep conversations with um, broader community and with some interlocutors of her own. Um, uh, it'll be a really a, 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 an emergent um, exploration with Tabitha, and I'm looking forward to that in the coming months. So stay tuned for that. Um, and in the context of this coming month, in addition to what uh, Bill just shared about our intentions to uh, host something with the, the, the three of these special people, um, just want to name two quick uh, um, uh, sort of announcements that uh, that are invitations to everyone. Um, first of all, a week from today, um, on June 2nd, uh, FOR is co-hosting a world premiere of a new film. Uh, we heard somebody reference earlier a film. And um, uh, here's a link to that information in the chat. It's called The Five Powers Revolution, and it's a... a um, an extraordinary uh, hour-long um, 
kind of animated film slash uh, documentary film uh, that talks about the special relationship between Thich Nhat Hanh, um, Sister Chan Kong, his longtime um, colleague and and friend and and, uh, partner in his work, and uh, Alfred Hassler of the Fellowship of Reconciliation and also their relationship to Martin Luther King Jr. Um, And so this would be launching next Thursday with a a, a digital virtual screening um, that morning um, uh, uh, and followed by a 45 minute um, conversation among some of the principals in the film, um, the, the filmmaker, uh, one of the key producers, uh, two, two of the producers, Laura Hassler, the da- daughter of Alfred Hassler, and um, one of the monks in Thich Nhat Hanh's tradition. It's taking place, uh, I, I hesitate to say this for those of you in Tacoma and other places on <laughs> west of the Mississippi, but it's at 6 a.m. Pacific, 9 a.m. Eastern time, a uh, little better for those, uh, but it's that means it's six, uh, sorry, 3 p.m. in uh France and Morocco and other places where we'll have people joining us and also uh, in the evening in Thailand and uh, sorry, Vietnam and, and, uh, and Japan. So um, please join us if you can, and otherwise the film will be made available soon thereafter, almost immediately for rent and purchase and access. Um, um, And then the other is uh, I really warmly invite anyone who is interested and has capacity to join um, Bill Wiley Kellerman and myself and thousands of others on the weekend of June 18th in Washington, D.C. for uh, the Poor People's Campaign Mass Assembly. Um, uh, FOR will be present. I will be part of that presence and and many other um, fellow uh, peace and justice movement um, uh, activists and just people. And we would love to have uh, you in our in our company um, we'll be sending out a message, I think, tomorrow, uh, to, and uh, you're, you're invited to join us in that space that weekend. And otherwise, to watch digitally, the whole thing will be live streamed uh, through many, many uh, virtual um, uh, points. So those are a couple invitations. Um, but again, thank you all uh, for this time together. It's been uh, such a such a gift. So I want to close us um, this evening with a prayer that I actually opened us uh, with at the beginning of this. And it's Dr. Wink, it's from um, Dr. Walter Wink's autobiography, My Struggle to Be Human. Um, and I actually, I love this prayer for grace that I, I consistently hold as prayer. Um, and I thought this would be a good way for us to end um, our time together. God, Lord and judge and forgiver, I affirm this day my commitment to you. I want to love you, care about you, nurture your life and power within me, rise from the death of my spirit. I can only offer myself surrendered to that which is greater and wiser than me. I want to be true to my own reality. Let me rest my weary soul in thee, Lord. Heal me, forgive me. Little wind, spirit guide and guardian angel, I need further to believe in your help. I need to see that Jesus too depended on your help. Oh God, give me wisdom. Shield me from the side of me that might take over and destroy. Let me find the blessings here, though where danger grows, the saving powers do as well. Amen. Amen. May your breath be our guide. Blessings to each and every one of you. Many peace and many blessings. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all. Good night, everyone. Good night.